For day two of Stoic Week 2015, I wanted to talk a little bit about a work and an author who I, I am particularly captivated by. Um, there is a lot of Stoicism in this, so it fits in with Stoic Week, but the author himself is not completely a Stoic, although he was quite attracted to certain aspects of Stoicism, particularly its, its moral theory, its, its ethics. And the author that I'm going to focus on this entire Stoic week is Marcus Tullius Cicero, the great Roman orator, lawyer, statesman, and indeed philosopher. It's through Cicero that we possess a lot of the information that we have about quite a few of the figures and schools of ancient philosophy in these very important bridge periods. Um, you know, much of the works of, of philosophers of antiquity, even the ones like Plato and Aristotle, we don't possess them in their entirety. And when it comes to the Stoics, we've lost most of what was written, unfortunately, unless, you know, we get lucky and happen to come across, you know, some archaeological find somewhere. You can always hope, right? And so Cicero was somebody who was fortunate enough to study with some of the main representatives, the, the, you know, t the cream of the crop of various schools of philosophy, um, both in Rome and, and in Greece. And towards the end of his life, he um, spent quite a bit of time writing, uh, in part because he wanted to, as he put it, take Greek philosophy and put it into the Latin tongue. He thought that um, it was important that that you know, Romans, who now were really at the center of the civilized world, should be able to read and think about Greek philosophy in their own language, on their own terms, not, not just you know, having to go off to Greece to study, um, not having to learn Greek and pretending that certain things can't be translated. There was kind of an elitism involved in that that Cicero really didn't like, and he thought that the Latin language was, in fact, rich enough to, to encompass um, what it was that Greek philosophers were offering. So this is a particularly important and interesting work. Um, it's, like I put here, it's a philosophical dialogue. It's actually a series of dialogues carried out in what we call five books. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with um, ancient literature, when we talk about a book in terms of Plato or Cicero or Marcus Aurelius or anybody like that, what we really mean is a scroll. We, we don't mean uh, a book in the sense of something that we hold in our hand. This is a libellum in Latin, by the way, something that the Stoics happen to have popularized. This, by the way, is the Loeb edition, uh, which has the Latin on one side and the English on the other side, so it's really about twice as thick as it needs to be in order to, to provide the entire thing. Five books, or rather five chapters, and each one of them is set out thematically. So we get presentations, like I put here on the board, presentations and then criticisms of the various important ethical systems of late antiquity, the ones that were being provided by philosophical schools, the ones that Cicero thought really needed to be taken seriously, the ones that were actually um, making their way into the intellectual and sometimes even the popular culture of the time. Now among them, uh, the, the two probably most important ones, the two that had the greatest gripping point in, in Roman culture, were the Epicurean and the Stoic schools. And Cicero is not a fan of Epicurus or the Epicureans or hedonism in general, as you'll find out if you read this work. By the way, um, one of the reasons I'm shooting this video is I would love to see people reading this work, and so I'm not going to try to tell you everything about it. I'm just going to give you some of the key points, and I'm really going to be concentrating on, on a little bit of book two and um, a good portion of book three. Um, the academic skeptics, the Academy of Plato, ended up falling into a kind of skepticism for, for a while before um, it, it made its way back to Plato's old philosophy, re-understood. Um, and um, then we also have the Platonic and Aristotelian philosophies. Uh, when, when you see peripatetic, that means Aristotelian, because Aristotle liked to walk around peripatetic 
Herbatain, uh, to walk around while he was talking. So, you know, a lot of his pupils imitated that. It's actually a good practice, keeps the brain active. Um, Aristotle didn't quite do it for that reason. But um, each of these is going to be considered, and it's going to be considered in terms of conversations that are happening between people. There will be some, you know, exposition, uh, particularly in Book 3, where Cato, the representative of Stoicism, says, well, you know, do you want me to, you know, give you the whole Stoic system? And Cicero says, yeah, that's, that's a great idea. Why don't you do that? And then Cicero, of course, in Book 4, will then go on to criticize the Stoic system. So what we've got here is a really cool, um, you know, composition in which Cicero himself has injected himself as a character, and he is carefully considering the different philosophies that are out there uh, in terms of the, you know, these fundamental questions, and he is getting to have the, you know, the philosophies presented by somebody who really believes in them, somebody who has studied them, somebody who has accepted them, somebody who has lived out that philosophy. So you can't get any, any better exposition than that, in, in my view. I put here, um, you know, sort of a reminder, what is the key issue of this work? The question about the, the ends, when we say the ends, um, you know, you can think of, well, the end physically of this book is right here, and then here's an end, and here's an end, right? We're not talking about ends in that respect. We're talking about goals, about purposes, about what puts everything else into perspective, about priorities, if you like. And the question here is, what is the highest good, or as they call it, the end of goods? You could think of it as sort of a scale uh, of goods. And what is at the top? What is the thing that you should sacrifice everything else for if you need to? I mean, if you think that it's pleasure, like the Epicureans did, you're going to live a very different kind of life than somebody who thinks that it's moral virtue, like the Stoics did, or who thinks that it's moral virtue, but mixed in with some other stuff, like, you know, the, the Aristotelians did, or that it's, you know, to acquire knowledge, whatever it requires, uh, the way the academic skeptics did, and, and arguably Plato did as well. These are the sorts of fundamental questions that are never going to grow old, and long after you and I have left this, you know, temporary abode uh, of our lives here on Earth, you know, millennia from now, human beings, if they're around, are still going to be asking and still working out answers to these questions. So it's really worthwhile, particularly during Stoic Week, to see what some of the best representatives of the Stoics that we possess had to say about this, and we find that in Cicero's book. Now, the last thing that I, I need to say before actually going into some of the, the sections is that what we're getting here is what is called middle Stoicism. It's not the old Stoa, which was Zeno, the originator, and Cleanthes, and Chrysippus, uh, and then some of their followers. And it's not the late Stoa, which are the texts that we actually possess, like, like Marcus Aurelius, and Epictetus, and Seneca. Um, instead, this is the middle period where we have these, these brilliant creative thinkers um, like Panatitas, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, other Stoics who are, who are grappling with these schools and arguing with them and trying to make sense of stuff. Cicero himself fits in there because Cicero himself, like I said, is attracted to Stoicism but can't buy into it entirely. He's also attracted to academic skepticism. He also likes some things about Aristotle. Now, the one group he doesn't like at all is the Epicureans, but you know, uh, many people in antiquity had that, that sort of view. Um, so what we're getting here is a, a highly developed Stoicism that still knows where it came from in the, the old uh, Stoa, and is sort of prefiguring where we're going to see it later on with figures like Epictetus and, and Marcus Aurelius. So that is uh, my little resume of this. Again, I can't suggest uh, strongly enough that you read this work. I don't necessarily think you should do it during Stoic Week, but it is one of the works 
that you should, if you want to have a philosophical education, you should at one time during your lifetime read through and think about. In book one of the De Finibus, Cicero has a character who is an Epicurean, Torquatus, present the Epicurean position on the final end, which is namely that what we should seek is pleasure, a life that is pleasurable uh, as much as we can. As it turns out, the, the most pleasurable is being free of pain, worry, all those sorts of things, not just a life of physical in, indulgence. In book two, Cicero himself is injected as a character, and he is criticizing from a Stoic perspective, or at least a perspective influenced by Stoicism, the Epicurean position as it's been put forward. A lot of his criticisms are, are quite frankly, a little bit um, off base and tendentious. It's, it's an interesting question, what's going on there? Why, why is Cicero making criticisms that he knows aren't really going to stick? But at one point in book two, he sets out this, this fundamental challenge, um, and it, it's a two-sided challenge. You could say that it's a fundamental challenge to any sort of hedonistic point of view, any, anything that thinks that ultimately ethics reduces to what's pleasurable and painful as being you know, the most important considerations. Um, it's also identifying pleasure and the theories that advance that as the greatest challenge to virtue or to moral worth. So let's look at, at what he says, and we're going to spend a little bit of time with the text. I'll do a little bit of quotation, but I've put the main points up here. So Cicero says that Epicureanism is really the main rival position. He says that we can dismiss the academics, because the academics are skeptics. They don't really know anything anyway, uh, in part because they say nobody knows anything. Um, they, don't, they don't have any positive uh, mode. He says Epicurus is a more troublesome opponent, because he is a combination of two different sorts of pleasure, and because besides himself and his friends, there have been so many later champions of his theory, which somehow or other enlists the support of that least competent but most powerful adherent, the general public. So Cicero is saying, if you want to have a virtue and you want to have a, a moral way of living that's distinctively human, you're always going to be sort of going against the crowd, because the crowd is going to naturally be attracted to something that, if it's not Epicureanism per se, Epicureanism is rather refined, uh, it's certainly going to be some kind of hedonism that takes pleasure to be the, the ultimate goal for human life. So he says, um, unless we refute these adversaries, all virtue, all honor, all true merit must be abandoned. Why? Well, because when you say that the reason why we should be virtuous, the reason why we should be morally good, the reason why we should, you know, perform our duties, you know, all those sorts of things that the Stoics stressed, that's just because that makes us feel good. Um, that's always a very slippery slope, because something else will also make us feel good, and usually better. And if we do that sort of reasoning, we're probably not going to end up engaged in virtue. We'll sell virtue for something else as soon as we find that, that something else that provides us with more pleasure and less hassle to get it. So he says, um, when all the other systems have been discarded, there remains a duel in which the combatants are not myself and Torquatus, not, not personal individuals, but virtue and pleasure. There is a fundamental fork in the road, you might say. And one has to choose this way or this way. You can't have both of them at the same time. The Stoics are rather uncompromising, unlike some of the other schools who they, they criticize for this, saying you, you can't compromise and say you're going to have it all. You're either going to have to pursue moral virtue or you're going to pursue pleasure. It's one or the other. This, by the way, corresponds in, in moral theory very closely to what we call a deontological ethics that stresses duty as the main um, concept 
that reveals to us what is fundamentally good and bad, the way that we ought to live, the way that we ought to make our choices and decisions. So, you know, it, it, it's, you know, it's going to be either virtue or it's going to be pleasure, one or the other. So then he goes on and he says, like I put here, if moral worth, and the word that he uses that we're translating here by moral worth is the Latin term honestum. It's a word that we get honest from, by the way. Honesty originally doesn't just mean telling the truth. It means something that's more pervasive, a way of life that is itself truthful, is straightforward, is good, is upright. And that's the way that, that honestum is used. Um, this is a very common distinction in ancient philosophy between, you know, the good as that which is pleasurable, the good as that which is useful because it leads to other goods that we, we want, and the good as intrinsically good. As, um, you know, for the, for the ancient Greeks, the, the good as such or the good as the noble. Um, the Latins translated that quite often by honestum. So, Cicero is going on to say, um, if moral worth can be shown to actually exist, um, then the entire system of Epicureanism collapses, the ethical system, not necessarily the physics or anything like that. Um, you, what he's saying there is, if you can show that not everything is a matter of pleasure and pain, but there is some, some other kind of value that transcends those, then those considerations of pleasure and pain must become secondary. So he says, um, my own view is that if I can succeed, yeah, well, here we go. Accordingly, I begin by defining um, the nature of moral worth, and then I'll deal with, with your points, he says. So by moral worth, we understand that which is of such a nature that devoid of all utility, it can justly be commended in and for itself apart from any profit or reward. So, very long uh, and, and somewhat fancy way, although good, of saying what I've got here on the board. Moral worth is that which is praiseworthy, that which we recognize as being good. When we praise something, unless we're being you know, facetious or we're being duplicitous, we're actually saying that something is good. That's why we praise people. What is praiseworthy, apart from any sort of considerations of pleasure, and apart from any considerations of usefulness or profit, or it leading to something else which we desire. When we're saying that something has moral worth, we're saying that it's intrinsically valuable. We're saying that it's good in itself, despite of its connections with other things. It may indeed lead to other things that we, we see as being valuable as well. You know, being a good person and doing the right thing might get you a re re reward, but if there's a big difference between doing the right thing because it's the right thing and doing the right thing for the reward. Uh, the reward, that's a matter of usefulness or utility that he's talking about there. Now, that's how he defines moral worth or the honestum. He says... Um, a formal definition such as I have given may do something to indicate its nature, but this is more clearly explained by the general verdict of mankind at large and by the aims and actions of all persons of high character. This is something where we don't necessarily have to be ancient Romans to get it. Cicero is saying that any civilized people are going to have some people who do the right thing because it's the right thing, because they recognize it as the right thing, and they want to align their own lives with that. That is what moral worth is. And for the Stoics, virtue is closely connected with that, because the virtues are what you know, allow us to, to embody and to express and to protect and to create this moral worth. Now, he says a few other things that are very interesting, too. Uh, and I'm not going to go into great detail about this. Again, I encourage you to read the work. Human rationality and our inclinations show to us what this moral worth is. Because it's not just one single thing. It is one category, but it encompasses a lot of things. So just to use a few examples here, he says, um, 
we've been, you know, we've been bestowed by, by nature the gift of reason and active, vigorous intelligence, able to carry on several operations at the same time with extreme speed. And because of this, we have a, we have a relish for our own kind. Because we're rational, we are sociable creatures. We have an inclination to connect up with other people, not just to nuzzle up against them the way animals do in a herd, but to carry on conversation, to get to know each other. Of course, you know, we, we often irritate each other and, and you know, compete with each other, but that's not all that there is. He also says, um, here we go, nature has engendered in mankind the desire of contemplating truth. This is a really interesting question that doesn't get deeply explored here. Why do we want truth? Wouldn't we be happier with a bunch of lies if the truth about things is often uncomfortable? Aren't we better off just being lied to and enjoying the pleasure or the usefulness of that? Cicero would say no. The Stoics would say no. We have an innate desire for truth because of the kind of creatures that we are. And that leads us to do the things that are required in order to be able to acquire and understand truth. So he goes on and he talks about you know, several different kinds of moral goodness. Um, you know, the, the, the virtues uh, fit into that. Um, we love truth. We love things that are trustworthy, simple, and consistent. We tend to hate things insincere, false, and deceptive, like cheating, perjury, malice, and injustice. And he says, you know, we want to develop our own capacities as rational human beings. That is part of moral worth. If that exists, if that's not just an illusion, then the Stoics have traction. In book three of this, this work, it is Cato, who is a Roman statesman, but also a Stoic philosopher who's living it out, who is talking with Cicero and who's doing most of the exposition. Um, Cicero has actually asked him <coughs> to lay out the Stoic system. <coughs> and we're not going to go into all of that in great detail here. Um, this is more of a teaser for you to try to get you to, to read the work, but also to present some of the key doctrines that were uh, important for the, these Stoics. And this is a particularly interesting set of passages and considerations. So, you know, the Stoic, the Stoic viewpoint can begin from a number of different entry points, you might say. And one of them is by considering our natural inclinations as the kind of creatures that we are, as human beings, as rational animals. So, he starts out by saying, um, it is the view of those whose system I adopt that immediately upon birth, a living creature feels an attachment for itself and an impulse to preserve itself and to feel affection for its own constitution and for those things which tend to preserve that constitution. What he means there is that when we're born and afterwards, you know, we're not very good at this as human beings, of course, they have a lot of ways of uh, almost killing themselves, Living creatures are attached to their own existence. They want to continue in existence. That's part of what it means to be alive. And they, they naturally want to do the sorts of things that are going to continue and even to augment their existence. And they're going to be naturally averse towards the things that detract from their existence, the things that are incompatible with their existence, that threaten it. And they're going to feel positively towards things which augment their existence or which, which aid their existence. They're going to feel negatively. They're going to be, be averse to things that are against that because they have this desire to continue in their being. It's so like he says, um, it, you know, this also means that we have self-consciousness. We feel affection for ourselves. And this leads to the conclusion it is love of self which supplies the primary impulse to action. Much of what we do is motivated by this desire, ultimately, not necessarily in the immediate sense, of continuing our being and augmenting our being. It's not selfishness, this love of self, in the sense of saying, you know, 
it's me against everybody else, that's not necessarily the way it has to be. There may be situations in which that, that becomes the case for the Stoic, but the Stoic doesn't make that as an immediate assumption. There's another aspect that's very important as well. He says, um, acts of cognition, which we may term comprehensions, or perceptions, or if you, you like, the Greek term katalepsis, literally grasping something, you know, we have getting hold of the world. When we're thinking, we're grasping in thought, in the distinctive way of human beings, uh, our environment. And we also turn our thought in upon ourselves and what we're feeling today and what we want to do later on and what we think about that. All of these are, are things that we, we do as human beings as part of our nature. He says, acts of cognition, these we consider meet to be adopted for their own sake because they possess an element that, so to speak, embraces and contains the truth. In thinking, we actually um, learn or enact our desire for truth, which C Cicero and the Stoics, Cato too, thinks is intrinsic to human beings. Um, this doesn't mean that we always desire the most truthful solution. We can be misled into other things. We can be tempted astray. We can even become, you know, uh, deceitful people and, and live out a lie, as, as we say. But that requires some habituation to take place. There have to be some, some things going wrong in, in <coughs> consistent ways for that to, to, to become what, what grips us. So we desire truth and we're averse to falsity. Um, this is something, again, which is sort of natural to us. Now, what's the upshot of this? He says, um, here we go. Um, all of this tells us that it's, it's uh, not desire that is actually steering us. Um, there we go. It's not, it's not pleasure, rather. He says, pleasure is not to be reckoned among the primary objects of natural impulse. I very strongly agree with them, for fear lest many immoral consequences would follow if we held that nature has placed pleasure among the earliest objects of desire. We do, in fact, desire pleasure. That, that is part of our animal nature, and perhaps even part of our human nature, since we've devised all sorts of pleasures for ourselves that the animals have no understanding of and uh, probably are better off not, you know, from a stoic perspective, not, not enduring. But our desire is not fundamentally about pleasure. It's about our preserving our own being and what is appropriate to our, our being, what conduces to it. And it's about truth and being averse to falsity and to gaining more and more truth, to understand things. What this means is that we're not just pleasure-desiring animals. We're not just hedonistically driven. There is more to life than that. And since there is more to life than that, we should prioritize that more, he says. So what does this lead to ethically? He says, what is in accordance with nature, our nature, our fully developed nature as human beings, is what is valuable. It has positive value. It's what he calls choice-worthy. What goes against that nature is um, worthy of being chosen against, you might say. Inestimate, you know, inestimable, uh, if we want to use the Latin version. Because estimabile is the, the Latin that he's using here. Um, it's something that we, we should choose against. So... What is, what is going to fulfill our nature as rational beings, as living beings, as rational beings? What is going to lead us to goodness? What is going to lead us to truth? Um, we should pursue that. If pleasure is going to interfere with that, if pleasure is going to get in the way, we should choose against pleasure, even though pleasure is something we feel desire towards. Because we should desire something greater than, than mere pleasure. He goes on, and he says, um, here we go. Um, that which is in itself in accordance with nature or produces something that else that is so, uh, and which therefore is deserving of choice, 
um, is, is valuable. That's, that's what we have to take as our criterion, as our clues. And then he says, the initial principle being thus established that things take in accordance with nature are things to be taken, things to be pursued, things to be chosen for their own sake, and their opposite, similar, things to be rejected. The first appropriate act, and so you know, they're using appropriate act as the translation there. Another way of translating that is duty. Uh, Cicero is actually going to write a whole book on duties, uh, you know, uh, on officium. Officium is the, um, the singular for it. Um, or in the Greek is kathekon. That's a term that the, the Stoics uh, used. It literally means in accordance with what is appropriate. Right? So these are things that follow from understanding the nature of human beings and our innate desires. So he says... Um, there we go. The first appropriate act is to preserve oneself in one's natural constitution. We have a duty. We not only have a desire, we have a duty to preserve ourselves in our natural constitution. Now, that doesn't mean just staying alive. That means not going out and getting so drunk that you ruin your liver. That means not going and, you know, engaging in risky behavior because that's, you know, uh, putting your, your constitution, your life, your, your existence at risk. It would also mean doing things that are necessary for continuing your existence. You know, you're not going to find Stoics um, saying that you shouldn't hold down a job if you need a job in order to live. Right? So some people may see the Stoics a little bit too bourgeois for them. Um, I, I tend to think of it as a good thing. Um, he goes on and he says, uh, the next is to retain those things which are in accordance with nature and to repel those that are the contrary. We have duties to do those things as well. <clears throat> then when this principle of choice and also of rejection has been discovered, there follow next in order choice conditioned by appropriate action. Then such choice, that over time, becomes a fixed habit. Finally, choice fully rationalized and in harmony with nature. And he says, it's at the final stage that the good properly so-called first emerges and comes to be understood in its true nature. So it's only when we actually engage in these appropriate actions that we do have inclinations telling us we have to do, but we also have all sorts of temptations leading us astray, and we can also get mixed up about this. It's when we engage in these habitually, over and over again, and develop a habit that we can fully understand what the good is. And this points out a really interesting issue. Um, can you convince somebody to become a Stoic overnight? Probably not. If Cicero and if Cato are right, one has to keep engaging in this over and over again. There will be some people who you explain this to, and they immediately say, yes, that makes perfect sense. That's probably because they have already been engaged in this process because of the way that they were raised, or the institution that they've been working in, or were formed by. And that's a good thing from the Stoic perspective. He says... Um, man's first attraction is towards the things in accordance with nature, but as soon as he has understanding, or rather becomes capable of, of conception, and has discerned the order and, so to speak, harmony that governs conduct, he thereupon esteems this harmony far more highly than all the things for which he originally felt affection, and by exercise of intelligence and reason infers the conclusion that herein lies the chief good of man the thing that is praiseworthy and desirable for its own sake, and that is what we ought to seek. So we, we can't find the final end without engaging in, you might say, in an experiment, the experiment of using our life, our choice, to determine ourselves in such a way as to be able to, to grasp what is, what is best for us. And if we can't uh, immediately see it, that's probably a sign that we're not near where we need to be. We haven't started to crest the hill yet. So these are all some really interesting considerations to keep in mind. In Book 3, Cato also provides an exposition of one of the famous doctrines of Stoicism about the indifference and the preferred and the rejected. And so let, let's take a look at what he's actually talking about there in these passages. You know, I've titled this The Good, the Bad, and the Indifferent, although it's going to turn out the indifferent isn't completely indifferent. 
If it was, then the Stoics would be in a real problem, as, as we can see. So what is good? Well, you know, virtue is good. Moral value, the honestum, is good. Living in accordance with nature, those are good. Those are, you know, since we're talking about the end, the final end, those are expressions of the end, of the best life, of the way human beings would do the best to live, um, what will most fulfill us. <clears throat> By contrast, uh, vice, uh, moral disvalue, the, the you know, terpe as opposed to the honestum, and living in contradiction with nature, living in such ways that even though it may feel natural to us, we're out of sync with the rest of our environment, we're in turmoil within ourselves, that's bad. Those are the, the fundamental goods and bads that everything else is centered around. Those are the poles. And then the Stoics are very famous for saying, look, everything else in between is indifferent. Um, health, wealth, your appearance, all those sorts of things that you don't have control over, they're really not that important. You, shouldn't, you should be putting your, your focus here on pursuing this and here on avoiding this. And don't worry so much about the stuff that's more trivial, that's not quite so important. Now that raises a big problem, right? Because Stoics also talk quite a bit about doing the right thing, duty, right? How do you actually express this? How does it connect up with the rest of the world? So he says, we have to make an exposition of the difference between things. For if we maintain that all things were absolutely indifferent, the whole of life would be thrown into confusion, and no function or task could be found for wisdom. There would be no distinction between the things that pertain to the conduct of life, and no choice need be exercised among them. But we, we do have to make choices, right? We have to make choices all the time between competing uh, desirable goods or you know things that present themselves to us as evils. So he says, accordingly, the Stoics went on to affirm that among those things which are of no importance to happiness or misery, there is nevertheless an element of difference, making some of them positive and some of them of negative value and others truly neutral. Among things valuable, among things that are, you know, you know, estimabilia in the Latin, are things like health, unimpaired senses, freedom from pain, fame, wealth, and the like. So they said that some afford an adequate grounds for preferring them to other things. Others are not of this nature. And similarly, among those things which are negative value, some afford an adequate grounds for rejecting them, like pain, disease, loss of the senses, poverty, disgrace. Others, not so. And so we have a distinction here between the preferred, the proegemena the in, in the Greek, and the rejected, the apo, literally away from proegemena, in the, the Greek as well. So things that are neutral are in fact neutral in one sense, but they're also not neutral totally. If you, if you have to sacrifice some of those things, like for example, you know, let's look at some of them that he talked about, health. If you have to sacrifice health to um, virtue, virtue wins out. It's, a, you know, it's not going to happen all that often, I, I hope. Um, but, you know, wealth, fame, those sorts of things. Uh, the Stoics are not saying those are awful, those are bad things, avoid being famous. They're not naysayers of life. But they're saying, look, fame quite often is going to entangle you with things that are going to get you out of, out of you know, uh, sync with the rest of the world and, and place you into competition and bring out your worst side and keep you from actually cultivating the best things. And fame can be, uh, you know, something to be rejected in some cases. Here's the thing, too. These things that are preferred and rejected, they're relative to the two final ends, the end of good and the end of bad. So he gives an example here. He says, in a royal court, no one speaks of the king himself as promoted to honor, right? But the term is applied to those holding some office of state whose rank most nearly approaches, though it's second to the royal preeminence. Similarly, in the conduct of life, the title proegemenon, that is promoted, is to be given not to those things which are in the first rank, but to those which hold the second place. Second place things are still important, 
And here's where the real upshot of this is. A little bit later on, he talks about um, duties again, afficium. He says, although we pronounce moral worth, the onestum, to be the sole good, it is nevertheless consistent to perform an appropriate act, in spite of the fact that we count appropriate action neither a good nor an evil. For in the sphere of neutral things, there is an element of reasonableness. The things that are preferred are reasonable. They are rational. Our duties are things to be preferred by us. We don't do duty solely for its own sake because we love duty and that's all we're about and turn, and turn ourselves into some sort of you know, weird, guilt-driven, uh, obsessive types. That's not the point of it. The point is to uh, enjoy happiness, to enjoy the full development of, of human rationality and human existence, and fulfilling our duties is a necessary component in doing that, in realizing that. So he says, in the sphere of these neutral things, there is an element of reasonableness, in the sense that an account can be rendered of it. And therefore, in the sense that an account can also be rendered of an act reasonably performed. Now, an appropriate act, a duty, an afficium, is an act so performed that a reasonable account can be rendered of its performance. This proves an appropriate act is an intermediate thing to be reckoned neither as a good nor as the opposite. So, why should we perform our duties then? Well, because that's the rational thing to do. If we want to live in accordance with nature more and more. Although he doesn't talk about this at this point. Think about what I talked about just a little bit earlier that was in there. That this involves the reconfiguration of habits. The building of our structure, of our motivations, of our choices, of our what we later on will call the will. Uh, which is really what is most who we are from the Stoic perspective. This, uh, in Greek, proairesis, our composite of choices that we make. That is really at the core of the person. And carrying out these duties, being able to recognize what really is a duty, what isn't a duty, and when they're to be preferred to each other to carry out good practical reasoning, that is at the core of the Stoic life. 